Starting out with Chuck Penson's excellent book on Heathcote test equipment, I'm going to flip to what I believe is Heathcote's first low voltage uh, regulated power supply, the IP20. Now I have touched on this before because I've been working my way through all of Heathcote's low voltage power supplies acquiring examples of them, restoring them, and doing videos on them. I've already done the IP18 and the redesigned version of it, which is a couple pages later, the IP2728. And I've done the, um, the IP2718, I've done the IP28, and the first one I did was the IP27. The IP27 is the redesigned version of the IP20 that's the subject of this video. The IP20 was introduced in 1962 and they made it for a few years discontinuing it in 1967. It sold during that period for about $73. It's functionally and in terms of specifications identical to the IP27 which was made for a somewhat longer period of time. All the controls are the same and that while the packaging is very different it's really nearly the same circuit. The form factor on the IP20 is tall rather than wide. The IP20's uh, design scheme, its paint scheme, its color, the style of knobs, just the overall styling is what's generally referred to as Classic 2, which many people think is the the apex of Heathkit's uh, test equipment products during the period this was made, that they didn't have anything that looked nicer, it looked like it belonged in a professional industrial design and they must have had a professional industrial design staff influencing these designs. The Classic 2 style brought most of the design aspects of the earlier Classic 1 uh, but smartened it up a little bit with a light gray striper on the perimeter of the panel and the callouts were often red for clarity and uh, they changed the knob design to um, basically this style here and Heathcote had a bit of a, a mixed bag of uh, series designators before the Classic 2. Uh, they were somewhat inconsistent and non-standardized in terms of what the first two letters of the model number went. Uh, with the uh, classic 2, they started doing things like saying, well, an IG prefix means instrument generator, for example, or IM meant instrument meter, or IO meant instrument oscilloscope. In this case, it's instrument power supply. It actually uses the same cabinet, the IP20 uses the same cabinet, as the IO21 oscilloscope. It does use transistorized circuitry by and large, uh, mostly germanium parts, uh, but it also incorporates a voltage regulator tube in the reference supply circuit. The voltage ranges go from off and then up to 50 volts in 5 volt increments. And again those are range increments. And then there's, of course, variable adjustment within the ranges. And there are four current ranges, 50 milliamps, 150 milliamps, 500 milliamps, and jumping to 1.5 amps. There's also an adjustable current limiter to select from about 30 to 100% within each current range. Okay, um, this particular IP20 power supply uh, as received from the eBay seller who was a ham radio operator and I think he had done some restoration work on this already. Uh, I think it's fully operational. I don't think it actually needs any restoration other than 
a bit of cleaning perhaps. Um, I did a perfunctory checkout and it did seem to all be working. I'll do a more thorough test after I do the, the cleanup operations. But just a, an overview at this point. Simple sheet metal case and um, sort of primitive arrangement, just four screws on the rear opening here where the power cord comes out and that just attaches to the back plate here and that holds the whole thing inside and then the the front bezel aligns with the recessed edge around here and that's what holds the whole thing together. The power transformer essentially sits on the bottom here, I mean it's hanging from the, the chassis but it's such that it it's right up against the bottom and you can probably see all the scratch marks. So this is just going to get a bath um, to clean it up and this will get some general internal cleaning and uh, the knobs and uh, banana plug knurled pieces here will come off and get cleaned. And I'll do a little clean up on the meter, a little bit of alcohol in the front panel I think, and that's about all it's going to need. Just a few immediate observations with this kit. I think this is not the original main capacitor. It is a vintage type of capacitor I think. Um, it's Nippon, Nippon Chemicon, a good brand. This I think is the original capacitor. This is the one that would be for the reference power supply and this would be the one for the main supply. Like the IP27 which is based on this supply, it does use um, two smaller yet heat sinked transistors and it uses three power transistors. These will be in parallel, these will be the main series pass transistors for the voltage regulation and this will be another series transistor which is turned on and off to uh, be the, the current clamp so if the uh, current goes uh, above the preset value this is the one that will start throttling back as opposed to these. And these are actually on a heat sink, an extruded aluminum heat sink, as opposed to being just uh, stuck on the back sheet metal panel like on the IP27. Either approach works. This is the more expensive one obviously. Some other obvious things. These resistors are not the original resistors. I don't know what happened to the original ones, but those are not ones Heath kit supplied. They would have been more like this, I think. Uh, and the solder joints are pretty sloppy. I mean, they're they're not cold joints, but it looks like this is an example of the original joint. It's pretty neat. There's not a lot of extra solder on it. I something must have happened to these other transistor or resistors at some point. I don't know if they got burned up or physically damaged or whatever. Or maybe they just weren't accurate enough. Um, and these are precision quarter watt metal film resistors. So somebody has replaced the originals with these more modern types. And let's see, I think all of these are original down there. Either wire wound or carbon composite. The biggest thing that jumps out to me is that the uh, regulator tube that would normally go here and which is the main thing that distinguishes the circuit of the IP20 from the later IP27 it's gone. I was really hoping to have one in here and uh, the seller did not mention that uh, it wasn't part of this uh, circuit anymore. Um, basically the IP27 which I've already done a video on uses a double stage Zener regulator circuit for the reference power supply. The first one 
I forget what it is, maybe it goes down to 90 volts or something and the other one knocks it down a bit lower. Uh, this circuit I think is, or was originally the same for the second zener, but the first zener was replaced by the tube, and it's not a vacuum tube, it's uh, a gas-filled tube, and it's, but it still performs very much like a uh, zener diode and it would be there to knock down the voltage for the first stage of the um, rectific or the uh, voltage regulation in that supply. So apparently that tube failed and they're probably unobtainium now so at some point the owner had replaced it and you can see here there's a, a terminal board that's where the socket would have gone. Let's see if I can get this guy upside down. Yeah, there's a little terminal board installed there, or terminal strip, and it has, uh, well, two diodes on it, and a resistor, and my guess is that that is the first stage um, regulator there using a zener, just like on the IP27 and then it goes on and um, does the second stage regulation with the Zener as it always was. This is the filter cap here. There's your half wave rectifier diode. This is your first dropping resistor and then you're getting into the Zeners after that. Uh, somebody's also replaced a couple of capacitors in here with types that are pretty clearly not the originals. And here's a diode and a more modern capacitor across it. I think that's a retrofit that was recommended by Heathkit for the IP27 to keep the transistors from blowing up if you change the voltage range switch too quickly. So it looks like that IP27 retrofit has been made to this IP20. And why not? They're basically the same circuit. Uh, these also look a little newer. I'm guessing that uh, these probably go just where they did originally but with newer caps. So I would say that from an electrolytic standpoint this has been recapped. This is a vintage cap down here. Um, yeah, so uh, <clears throat> I'm a little disappointed it doesn't have the tube in it, but I'm still going to say this is an IP20 even with that circuit modification. Now here's the other thing that happens with that. People have commented that the light bulb that's usually used behind this uh, red jewel lens there for the power light seemed like a really big bulb for what it needed to do. It was a 6 watt bulb, almost like you'd have in a reading light or something, um, and instead of one that you would just use for a pilot lamp. And I think the reason for that is that when using this regulator tube, its series dropping resistor um, on the original IP20 design was just a 6 watt, I think 120 volt incandescent light bulb. And uh, if you're going to change the circuit to use uh, the Zener diode, you don't want that light bulb there anymore, <clears throat> which means it has to come out of the circuit. And then what do you use to make up the pilot light here if you don't have the light bulb anymore? And I think I can see down in there, it looks like there might be a dropping resistor, some shrink tubing. Um, really kind of hard to see, but yeah, it just comes right from the switch. I don't see any extra resistors on there. So I'm thinking there's probably, oh yeah, I can see it now. Yeah, there's at least one resistor stuck in here. So um, somebody's converted this to an LED. There's an LED jammed into this uh, lamp housing and a series dropping resistor. There might also be a diode or something in there. All 
glopped up with silicone sealer or epoxy or whatever that is. Actually, it's more like hot melt glue. So that's been changed out of necessity due to the loss of the regulator tube. And I don't know what's going on with this. <laughs> this is, uh, I don't know. It kind of looks like maybe the original fuse holder failed and somebody retrofitted a different model of fuse holder that had a, a stake on uh, or push on connector down here and then they just covered it up with some uh, heat shrink tubing. But otherwise, this looks pretty much unmolested. All right, drop the knobs into the soapy warm water bath along with these three pots, or not pots, the uh, knurled banana jack. I still don't know what to call those. <laughs> The knurled parts of the banana jacks. There we go. And I've got my nice warm soapy water bath here going in the sink. And it's not deep enough. I'm gonna have to add a little more water. All the scrubbing and soaking and soaking and scrubbing <laughs> is completed draining my utility sink do a little bit of rinsing I've already gone over all the knobs and little bits with the toothbrush that sound you hear is my lift pump necessary to get the basement sink drained up to the level of the sewer line. Now for a bit of cool water rinsing. Getting all those parts to dry. That guy's just going to air dry there overnight. That uh, textured paint really holds moisture for a long time. It doesn't just dry off in a few minutes. I misspoke earlier. I was taking this to be a non-electrolytic capacitor, but it is an electrolytic, and uh, it's a 250 microfarad part, and it's in the bias supply for the um, current uh, control circuit. I have no idea why the previous owner didn't replace this, although he may have just tested it and decided it was still good. So I may leave that alone for the time being. Well, I've taken some time to trace out the circuit here. Everything in this area and down into here. This is the main part of the reference voltage power supply. So I got it penciled out here. Um, and that translates to this circuit which is essentially identical to this circuit from the IP27 power supply which is of course the model that replaced this one and looking at the schematic for the IP20, which is, again, this one, and comparing them, it's the same circuit, except that the um, OB2 tube, voltage regulator tube, and its 6-watt, uh, 120-volt incandescent lamp replaces this resistor, this resistor, and these two Zener diodes. The capacitors all remain, and this circuit from this point on is the same. So, with the IP27 and losing the OB2 tube, they had to replace the incandescent bulb 
with this 2500 ohm resistor, 2 watt resistor, and this Zener, 110 volt Zener, and this 68 volt Zener, and this 1200 ohm 2 watt resistor. So those parts got changed out to replace the tube, and then it appears to be just the same going to the right, although it's drawn differently. As far as I can tell, it's the same. And as I thought before, this very modern looking capacitor and the diode across it um, looks like it appears here in the circuit. And if I translate that to the IP27 supply circuit, that looks like what I remember. I'll have to go back and check. But I believe that is the fix for blowing up some of the transistors if you change the uh, voltage selection knob too quickly. I'm presuming that put some transients in the circuit or something. Um, haven't really figured it out, nor have I ever seen it really explained, but um, that seems to be the same. The only other thing that I'm kind of curious about at this point is I had noticed when looking before that there seems to be some differences in this area. There's the uh, overcurrent relay and there's a couple of capacitors here and there's this diode and um, I'm not sure that the circuits are the same so I'm gonna map that out. Alright another one of my famous figure out the schematic by tracing the circuit and uh, then comparing it to the IP27 it looks pretty much identical. It definitely complies with component values um, up in this area and their connections. It does not completely match the IP20 schematic that I have, although I've found a number of references suggesting that this schematic is simply drawn incorrectly and that the kit was never built that way but I don't have my hands on a uh, complete assembly manual for the IP20 to see if that's the way they actually told people to build it or not. I'm going to have to dig on that a little bit. Um, certainly the most critical stuff is all in there, but there are some things like a diode here which does not in any way, shape, or form appear on the same transistor up here, Q3, identified as X3. Here there's a diode from the uh, base to the emitter that just isn't present here. However, there is a 4700 ohm resistor going from the base to the emitter, and that is here. So, I definitely don't see the diode down in this circuit around Q3. Just doesn't seem to be there. I was trying to figure out if this relay coil being up here on the IP20 schematic was just a mistake or if they actually built it that way at some point. And it occurs to me that if the coil was really down here where it is on this example and on the IP27, that one side of the coil comes out of the wiper of a potentiometer, which it sort of does up here, but it's a different potentiometer. And the other end of the coil goes to the negative side of this diode, which it still does. Um, it may just be a drafting error. And so the discrepancies I've found between the IP27 and the IP28 schematics, never mind the obvious change down here, is that um, the IP20 did not have this stabilization RC network across the collector and emitter of this transistor 
but it's definitely there on the IP27 and it has been retrofitted to this example. Uh, this capacitor here, which might sort of form the same kind of stabilization but a little differently, is definitely not present on the IP27 and it is not present on this example. This diode is definitely missing on this example and on the IP27. Otherwise it seems like it's the same circuit. The component designations are quite different, but the values of the components seem to be the same. I haven't checked every last one of them, but a bunch of spot checks makes it look like they are the same. So, very similar circuits. Um, I'm probably going to redraw this, um, trying to clean up some of this. One thing that I hated about the IP27 was they had all these little continuations going off and then you have to jump up here and try to make sense of it where they put this switch detail for the meter and um, I can see where they maybe wanted to unclutter this area but at the same time the way they showed the same circuit on the IP20 schematic seems like it's considerably better it's where the switch should be in the circuit and it looks like it's done in such a way that it doesn't really clutter it up too much I may go with that approach when I redraw it. Um, one, some crazy stuff they did. Yeah, just show resistors going every which way. Just pretty poor draftsmanship. And when I see things like that, I'm thinking sloppiness may have caused this um, kind of thing to happen as well. Uh, and then the relay, this may have been a period uh, a period way of showing relay contacts, but it's nothing that I've encountered before. I suppose those are supposed to look like two physical contacts. They're jumping from a schematic symbology to a pictorial symbology. Again, bad practice, I think, then and now. Um, but it is the same as what the IP27 schematic showed. It's just drawn funny. So, with that happy note, I'm going to move on. Okay, let's fire this guy up. Um, let's see. DC on standby switch is down. Voltage is down. Current is down. I'm going to turn it fully up. I'm going to set it for the 1.5 amp range. I'm going to set the switch to voltage for the meter. I've got it hooked up to my electronic load and I'm going to turn it on and go for a 25 volt range. Okay, 25 volt range adjust the fine knob and of course nothing happens because the meter is on the side of the circuit that requires the switch to be on. So let's go there and we're in the uh, 25 volt range which is a little bit confusing I think it's actually 20 to 25 volt range they show I think the top end of the range on the switch so right now I'm around 20 volts and I can go up to a little over 25 volts, um, close to 26 volts. So in this range I can adjust it this much. Let's go with 24 volts and my uh, load is showing about 24 volts. I'm setting it to 500 milliamps and I haven't turned the load on yet. So let's um, switch the meter over to current and turn the load on and it bounces up and current is on the top range so it's showing 500 milliamps and the load says that the supply is putting out 500 milliamps. The voltage is 23.76 so again very close to the 24 
let me um, switch the load off and see what happens to the voltage. Barely moved. So the regulation is quite good on that. Actually it went up slightly when the load was applied. We can go back to here and I'll switch the load on and off. Negligible change. So let's uh, go up to 45 volts. So I'm going to set it to uh, 40 volts. I'm going to turn the voltage knob down to 40 volts. And the load says I'm pretty close to it. The meter is not absolutely precise. Let me just tweak it a little bit to get closer to 40 volts. And now it's a little bit on the high side of the meter, depending how you look at it. This is looking at it pretty straight on, so it's just a little bit on the high side of the meter. And uh, it's still doing 500 milliamps. I'm going to switch the range to 500 milliamps and see if it'll keep working. And it is. Voltage looks like it dropped slightly. And not much. Yeah, that's about the same. Actually, I'm not seeing a change here at all. I did just a moment ago and I did the same thing. So we're at 40 volts, doing 500 milliamps which should be the top limit of this current range. So I'm going to back off a little bit now and see when my uh, voltage starts to drop. Okay, I think I'm seeing a bit of a voltage drop there. Yep and the output just shut off. Now it shut off, I was in current limiting mode there by turning the knob down here and it shut the supply off. That's because it considered it now to be an overload condition and you may have heard the relay click in there and that was that's how this supply reacts. It doesn't just have an electronic current limiting function, it also has a current overload function done through a relay and since the relay clicked and I heard it and the supply dropped to nothing, that means that that engaged. So the relay is open now, the output is disconnected. And to reset that, I think I need to turn the standby switch down and remove the load. And then turn the output back on and it does come back, it's reset. But, if I now engage the load, the current limit is still set to the same place. It should kill it right away. Here goes the load. Click. Yep. It dropped out. So I'll remove the load. I'll reset the circuit. Turn it back on, and I'm there again. Um... So that's a demonstration of the functionality there. I've lowered my electronic load to 400 milliamps requirement. And let's see what happens when I turn the load on. Okay, it's doing 40 volts and it's doing 400 milliamps. So that is obviously below the th current threshold. And now I'm going to change my load and slowly ramp it up. Four ten, four twenty, four thirty, four forty, four fifty, four sixty, four seventy. 480, and I saw a slight voltage drop there, 
490, and now we're getting electronic voltage reduction, but not the overload. And that was what I was hoping to demonstrate here. I haven't got to the threshold where it kicks the relay open and disconnects the output, but it is dropping the voltage. It's dropped it to 35 volts, thereabouts, 36 volts. And the current is still holding at 490. Now if I take the current back to 480, I should see the voltage return to 40 volts. So that was a demonstration of the electronic current limiting which is done by reducing the voltage. Now that's because this is a electronic load program to be constant current. It's going to pull 480 milliamps or 490 milliamps, whatever I'm telling it to, as long as the supply will put it out. Uh, so the supply is dealing with that by reducing the voltage. Um, and when the voltage is reduced enough, then it can still put out the, the current, but it's basic Ohm's law. So I'm going to turn the load back off. I'm going to turn my current full up. And I'm going to reduce the voltage. Once again, we see that the voltage in this range, this 45 volt range, can go from a little bit below 40 up to about 46. If I change down here to the 20 volt range, I should be able to adjust from about 14 volts up to a little over 20 volts. And I've checked all these ranges. I'm not going to go over it and over it in the video, but and now I've turned the supply off. And I have done a complete ring out on this before I did this little bit of video, and it does work in all ranges. I verified that. So this was just a quick demonstration. There was one more thing I wanted to scope out here, and that was the power lamp. I had guessed that it was probably an LED inside there, but it's all potted, so I don't want to tear it apart. I traced the yellow and black wires from here, and they just go down to two of the winding taps on the power transformer secondary. And um, the way this supply works, and that's why it has so many voltage ranges, is there are many voltage taps on the secondary winding. Um, and this bottom one here is the common and that just goes straight into the bridge rectifier and all the other ones are voltage taps so what they've done is you know the guy who did this uh, knew that there's always a voltage across each two or any group of windings really uh, or any group of taps on the winding and he picked two of them, they probably all have about the same voltage between them because it's in 5 volt steps. So he's getting, you know, some sort of uh, approximately 5 volt AC signal between these two windings. He probably just randomly picked those. It could have been the next two or the next two. Uh, and then he's coming down. I can definitely see that there is a 160 ohm resistor or what appears to be. I can't see the entire resistor and then there's the lamp. I don't know for sure that it's an LED in there, but it probably is. And it could be a tiny little incandescent or even a neon bulb, I suppose. Uh, this could just be a current limiting resistor for a neon bulb, but it appears to be 160, which looks like a very low value for a current limiter on a neon bulb and that's also a very low voltage for a neon, so I think it's an LED. Uh, there may be, and probably is, a diode in there somewhere inside the potting or the shrink tubing. Uh, there may also be another resistor. You may have, you know, stuck a couple or two or three resistors in series tweaking the brightness, but it's clear that it's some sort of a low voltage lamp with some sort of series resistance and maybe a rectifier diode uh, connected across there and that's how the powers or the power lights being operated now 
reminding that formerly the power lamp would have been this um, 120 volt 6 watt incandescent bulb that was part of the reference supply regulator circuit. All right, a final look around with the case reassembled. If you get that uh, lamp at just the right angle, it's quite bright, but a little bit off axis, and it's really hard to see. Okay, I'm going to go over the schematic for the IP20 now. When I was downstairs in my basement, I was showing this version of the IP20 supply. Apparently it's an older version, and it had all this craziness here, and the weird relay contacts, and other problems. Uh, a capacitor which wasn't really there, and didn't look like it would do anything. Um, and the misplaced relay coil and a diode which wasn't there and so on. Um, this is another version I found of the schematic, also an IP20. I think it's a cleaned up and somewhat fixed version, but I don't know its date. Anyway, they, they neatified <laughs> the resistors and some other things. They showed the relay contact with a little bit of a better symbol. Uh, they rejiggered things a little bit. They still show the relay coil in the wrong place, um, and they still show the diode, which isn't there. Um, but this is the one I'll use for description here. So let's start with the primary side of the power transformer. We have the incoming line, um, and it's shown here as not having a ground pin, but in fact it does, and I'm pretty sure the one I, the power supply I have is originally equipped with a three terminal line core. They just don't show it. Of course, the ground lead goes to the chassis. Uh, you've got your fuse, your power switch, which is part of the voltage range switch, and then the coil and back to neutral. You've got three windings. You've got one for the bias supply. You've got the main power supply secondary winding with all of its taps. And you've got the reference supply winding, 170 volts. You go from 7 volts up here to whatever the voltage is up here. I'm sure it's over 50 volts, but how much more I'm not sure off the top of my head here. And then you've got 170 volts down here for the reference supply. The way it was done on the IP20 is you have a half wave rectifier and a filter capacitor. Then you've got the uh, OB2 regulator tube, which acts sort of like a Zener diode, sort of. Um, this 120 volt 6 watt incandescent lamp acts as a voltage drop or current limiting resistor and presumably there's some conduction in this direction sort of like a Zener would do. I've never really looked up how these tubes work but I think it's got to be something like that. And then you have the regulated voltage here. It has a resistor and capacitor filter on it and this is then your regulated uh, voltage that's used in the rest of the circuit. There is a, another Zener stage down here which knocks it down to 56 volts. That's the actual working reference supply voltage. And to get best stability out of this final regulator stage, it's important to have the correct current through the Zener diode. So there is this potentiometer here, which 
you can adjust to control the zener current and thereby make sure that its zener voltage is what it should be and stays there in the most stable possible way given this type of circuit. And there's another filter capacitor here. Um, so basically from here to here you've got your Zener reference, that's your reference power supply for the voltage regulator circuit. Now that we know that, let's look at the basic primary power supply. So we've got all these taps here and the power supply changes taps here so that it's not dropping a lot of voltage. This is after all a supply that can go from 0 to 50 volts output. You could have a secondary winding up here which would be you know maybe 60 volts or something. It's always got to be more than the output voltage because you're dropping something in the regulator. But then let's say you were only trying to get 5 volts out of the thing. You'd be dropping you know 50 some odd volts through the regulator circuit and that's a lot of dissipation especially on a power supply which can go up to one and a half amps so it's a lot of wattage to get rid of and it would get stinking hot and that's a whole other problem so what they're doing here is they're making you work within five volt ranges you pick the winding which gives you a secondary voltage that's just a little bit above the range that you're trying to work in say 20 to 25 volts you end up with you know a few volts higher than that and then the most you're dropping is maybe five volts or so in the regulator circuit so it, it helps a lot with the heat anyway all of that is applied across the bridge rectifier there's a full wave or a full bridge rectifier and it's full um, wave rectification you've got a filter capacitor here and a bleeder resistor across it so that it doesn't hold on to its charge uh, when you turn the power supply off. Now this bit of shading here is sort of a weird thing. I think they did that to help the eye distinguish between this part of the circuit and this part of the circuit because they're drawn so close together. Um, they probably thought that people would cross up one of these lines with this line or something. I don't know. I've never seen that done before. It's sort of a weird thing. But I believe that's the reason. So you end up with um, your filtered or uh, rectified filtered voltage from here down to here. The positive side goes through the uh, overload relay contacts and through the current regulator circuit which we'll ignore for the moment but essentially it's going through some resistances through a power transistor, um, through some more resistances, through this shunt here, and out the reset standby switch, and to the positive output of the power supply. Returning current comes in down here, and comes along here. It splits 50-50. Half of the current goes through this series pass transistor, Half it goes through this series pass transistor. And because they're never going to be conducting exactly the same amount, there are these 2 watt resistors. They're um, uh, balancing resistors, 0.33 ohms each. So whatever difference there is between the conduction or conductivity of these two transistors is made up for in these resistors. And then finally the current merges and returns by this line back to the um, negative side of the bridge rectifier. So the voltage regulation is done by controlling how much these two transistors conduct. All right, let's look up here at the error detection transistor. This is connected with its emitter essentially on the positive output of the power supply, assuming the uh, standby switch is closed and its base is connected down here through the coil of the uh, relay to the wiper of the voltage control potentiometer. Well, what is that across? It's 
got a big resistor network on one side of that potentiometer, the other side of which goes to the negative side of the power supply. That's also the negative side of the reference supply. They're tied together. The other side of the fine voltage control pot goes to this bunch of resistors and goes to the positive side of the reference supply. So essentially we're putting the reference supply from here to here and through these two banks of resistors and again these are all on the uh, voltage range selector switch. This is two different gangs of the same switch. As I've redrawn it here, if this is the positive side of the reference power supply and this is the negative side of the power supply and the negative side of the reference supply, it's the same electrical point, you've got these two gangs of resistors here on the voltage range switches and that just boils down to an adjustable resistor here and an adjustable resistor here and they're ganged together so they both change the same amount. And in the middle of them is this fine voltage control potentiometer. But that's what all this complex looking stuff boils down to. It's just a big voltage divider from the reference plus to the reference minus and then the wiper in the middle comes off and this is what you adjust and now we're back to the main schematic. It comes up here. It has a filter capacitor going to the minus side of the supply and it continues up and it goes to the base of the error detection transistor. So you have a constant voltage here essentially whatever the user has set using the fine voltage control potentiometer. Meanwhile on the emitter of the transistor this is the positive output of the supply. So we're comparing the actual positive output of the supply with a fixed positive voltage that is whatever the user selects based on the available reference supply voltage which is Zener regulated so this point doesn't move once you've made your adjustment of the potentiometer. Let's say you've set it to 40 volts. This is going to stay there and now the supply is maybe at 40 volts, let's just say it is, but now we put a load out here so necessarily uh, the voltage here is going to drop a little bit. So now the uh, voltage at the emitter is lower than the voltage at the base and that starts turning this transistor off because it's a PNP transistor. Uh, the way this is set up here is this line here through this resistor goes back to the negative side of the reference power supply and this is set up to have a constant current going through it. So if you're getting less current I'll use my other finger Actually, I'll use a pointer. That's even better. So if we're turning this transistor off a little bit because the voltage here is dropping due to a load, it's got less current coming through here into the base of this transistor, which is the um, error amplifier. Remember, there's a constant current going through here. So if you have less current here and a constant current here, that must mean an increase of base current on this transistor. So a decrease here and an increase here. Uh, an increase in base current results in an increase here and it changes the... Uh, amount of voltage applied to the base of the two series pass transistors and essentially causes them to conduct a little bit more therefore allowing a bit more current to flow in the overall circuit thereby bringing the voltage back up until such a point where you reach an equilibrium. 
There's also a bit of an enhancement here. In addition to the method that was already described where it's just looking at the difference in the output voltage from the reference voltage as selected by the user, uh, there's also this shunt resistor here. So this is basically a shunt, a 0.33 ohm resistor with a 50 ohm DC regulation potentiometer across it and then through this series resistor also feeds the base of this transistor. And the way this is set up as the uh, current increases here which you would have as, as you're increasing your load and that's what causes the output voltage to drop you end up with a voltage developed across this potentiometer which is then applied to the base of the error detection transistor. So it's another way of detecting the error um, besides just the difference in base to emitter voltage. And that enhances the uh, regulation circuit. Okay, now for the um, current limiting functionality of the supply. I already mentioned how the positive side of the diode bridge and its filter capacitor goes through the overload contacts and then through the current limiting pass transistor and on out to the positive side of the uh, output terminal. Um, so this is kind of confusing the way it's drawn and I'd made a, an attempt to redraw it here which isn't much better at least it gets rid of whatever this is supposed to mean. It's hard to visualize this in different positions. But essentially it's messing with the available resistors. This is the potentiometer here. That's your current adjust or current limit. Um, and then there's a series 9.1 ohm resistor going to this transistor which is this one. So this is your normal path here. Um, and depending, and that's with the switch in its counterclockwise most position. Then as you turn the switch up, it starts introducing uh, these other resistors here, uh, essentially in parallel from here to here. So there's now, instead of the current just going through here, and now it can take paths around it in different degrees. Uh, so that's what this part of the switch is doing up here. And then finally when you get it to the rightmost or most clockwise position, another piece of this switch's uh, wiper engages over here and brings this extra 10 ohm resistor in, which I was at a loss to how to depict more clearly. But it, again, just adjusts the uh, resistances around here as needed to make this part of it work here. So just be aware this is an adjustable resistor which gets adjusted as needed to make things work out over here. So um, if you just look at this as a simple circuit we have this uh, 7 volt limiter bias power supply it's half wave rectified and filtered so we have approximately 8.8 .8 volts from here to here and that uh, negative, let's see, yeah, the, the positive side of the supply is connected to the positive side of the main supply, so those are commoned, and you essentially have this bias supply applied through the current limiting pot, through this resistor, and into the emitter of this transistor, and then because it's a PNP, the current flows out of the base and returns to the other side of the, re uh, the bias power supply. Uh, hooking it up this way essentially means that we have plenty of emitter to base current and the transistor is in saturation. In other words, it's turned fully on as much as it can be. And therefore, it presents essentially no... Uh, resistance 
to current flowing from the main supply through it and on its way out. It's just like it's a short circuit from here to here. Um, and what happens when you start getting too much current? Well, as you have more current going through here, and remember all the current going out the power supply it has to go through this uh, current limiting potentiometer or a portion of it accounting for this shunt network here. And at some point you're going to generate enough voltage here that it overcomes the uh, the diode's natural uh, bias requirements. You need to have a certain amount of voltage here before the diode will start conducting. And once you have achieved that much voltage by virtue of a certain amount of excess current running through the supply, finally the diode will turn on and now it prevent, or provides a alternate path for the current on the bias supply. Now instead of having to go through here and back, now some of it can go this way. That means less current going this way. This is the easier path. And that means less emitter to base current. And therefore this transistor is no longer in saturation. And it starts to increase its emitter to collector resistance. So it's essentially like putting a resistor in here that starts reducing the current in the circuit. Reducing the output voltage effectively. So when you get to that magic point, depending how you've set this uh, current limiting potentiometer, once you get to that point, it starts turning off this transistor, thereby restricting the amount of current. And in effect, what that does is because you have to look at that and the output load as being another resistor in a resistor voltage divider. What really happens is that the uh, voltage output starts to drop which naturally reduces the current through the load and that's what we're trying to accomplish. Um, so that in a nutshell is how this power supply achieves current regulation or a constant current mode. You can look at it that way. Another aspect of this circuit is the overload protection relay. This is what kills the power supply altogether if there is an actual short circuit at the output. We're not relying on the solid state current limiter circuit already mentioned to handle protection of the supply in that case. So that's the job of the, the relay, which is down here. And what I've done is I've redrawn that part of the circuit in a little easier to understand format. Once again, we have the reference power supply plus down on the fine voltage control potentiometer. And the other side of that, through more resistors, makes its way back to the, the minus side of the main power supply, which is also the minus side of the reference supply. Uh, so at any time we have a positive voltage here on one side of the relay coil, and it's about a 7 volt, I should write that in, I suppose. So we have a 7 volt relay coil here. And normally there is no place for the, uh, the current to go through this relay. Everything here is unsatisfactory. But if you actually put a short circuit on the output, or some very low resistance, a massive overload certainly, now both the positive and the negative terminals of the power supply are essentially the same volt or close to it, and now the positive power supply from the reference supply through the fine voltage control pot can go through the relay coil and through this diode, that's this one up here, through this diode to now what is which is now a low supply voltage on account of the short back to the minus side. So now there's this path for current to go through the relay coil and return. 
So again, once it comes off the reference supply, goes to the relay coil through the diode, through the standby switch, through the loads, low resistance, and back to the negative side of the reference supply, which is also the negative side of the main supply. So now the relay energizes, and back here, the relay co uh, contacts, which are normally closed, open up, and that essentially interrupts power to this point. So now there's nothing going on, and you would say, well, doesn't this just chatter? Um, well, it doesn't really care. <laughs> because once the relay is pulled in and this is disconnected from power up here everything to the left of here is just floating but we still have this original path through the relay coil through the diode through the load resistance and back so the relay stays energized once it's started to and the only thing that can reset that is to either remove the load which breaks the path and the relay de-energizes and returns to normal or if you can't do that then you open the standby switch which is the toggle switch on the front of the power supply and that essentially interrupts the load or disconnects the load from the supply breaks the um, the lock in here so either that or removing the load or both will turn the relay back off and restore the supply to normal operation Here's another little aspect of this supply. There is this um, thermistor or uh, temperature dependent resistor anyway. Um, 500 ohms at 25 degrees Celsius. And it is essentially wired from this point to this point. So it's across the base to emitter junction of the series pass transistors. And we know that for these transistors to turn on, there has to be at least a certain amount of emitter to base current flowing. Um, the current going through here has to be above a certain threshold in order for the transistors to conduct from emitter to collector. Um, so normally the amount of current is assured by this transistor turning on and providing a a path um, around these transistors essentially so emitter current coming in here or coming in here coming to this transistor going through its emitter and out its collector and then to the same place it would have come through here so uh, this is assuring a certain amount of base current um, and thereby turning these guys on but if you put this thermistor here and it's essentially going from here to here, if it starts conducting more than the current that should be turning these guys on is instead flowing through the thermistor instead of through the emitter to base junctions of these transistors and therefore it's stealing current from them, it's taking another path and therefore they start shutting off and that's there to keep them from overheating if the power supply for some reason gets in a situation where these guys start baking because there's too much current going through them their temperature will go up the resistance of this goes down it starts stealing or bypassing current around their emitter to base junctions and they start shutting off and um, I'm not sure I haven't done the math on this if it shuts them off entirely or if it just throttles them way back or whatever. Um, anyway, that's the function of it there. It's to prevent overheating of these transistors. And it's physically mounted inside the heat sink, right where the trans one of these transistors mounts to the heat sink is right where this guy's located. Um, I think I've covered most of this circuit, but I'll look at the meter circuit now. <clears throat> The basic mode of operation for the meter is as a voltmeter to measure the output voltage. So I've simplified the circuit. It's really these couple of switches down here and the meter and a couple of resistors. Uh, but when you're in the voltage mode of the meter, the 50 ohm 
one milliamp full scale meter is in series with a 4950 ohm resistor and that's connected directly across the plus and minus output terminals. So let's say that we're in a 5 volt setting on the power supply and it's turned up fully so you have 5 volts across the plus and minus. What you have then is a 4950 ohm resistor in series with a 50 ohm resistor and that makes a 5000 ohm resistor. 5 volts divided by 5000 ohms is 1 milliamp which of course would give the meter a full scale reading since it's a 1 milliamp meter. Um, the only thing that really changes then is depending which voltage mode you're in. And there is Let's see if I can find it. Yeah, over here, this part of the circuit, this here stands in for this 4950 ohm resistor in my simplified version. And what it all boils down to is that the meter actually has three different ranges. When the power supply is set to its 0 to 5 volt range, the resistors here are used just like I have here and therefore 5 volts gives a full scale reading on the meter. When you're in the 10 volt range or the 15 volt range the resistors here are used functionally as this one to result in the meter having a 15 volt full scale reading in which case if you're on the 10 volt range it's still the same scale on the meter, but you're only going to read about two-thirds full scale when it's at, uh, at 10 volts. Then all of the other ranges, going all the way up to 50 volts, use the third range of the meter, which is 50 volt full scale. And all you're going to see is fractions of 50 volts on the meter. And so then you use, once again, a third resistance value. That's why there's one, two, three resistance values, starting out with the 4950, adding 10K to that for the 10 volt and 15 volt range, and then when you're in any higher range, then we add a 35K resistor in series. Um, and uh, that essentially scales the meter to read 50 volts full scale, like I said before. Uh, the reason they did it this way is with a 50 volt full scale meter, if you're on the lowest three ranges, 5 volts, 10 volts, and 15 volts, you're so far off to the left of the meter that it's really hard to get enough resolution there to tell what you're really setting the voltage to. But once you're in the 20 volt and higher ranges, uh, there's enough meter resolution to adjust fairly accurately. So that's what this switch is doing here. Uh, I didn't actually pan it out here. I think that um, what it's actually doing here is it's uh, adding the 35K not in series but in parallel with these other resistors to get that other range. Uh, I think that's why there's this extra gang of the switch. I didn't map it out, but it looks like normally you're going to have... Uh, the 4950 here and then coming out here then if you go to the 10 or 15 volt ranges you're adding the 10k to the 4950 and then coming out here but if you go to the highest range now yeah that's right because now this switch is set up let's see I hate reading these things they're really hard to figure out you have to mentally imagine the thing rotated. Um, so that point, yeah, this switch then becomes shorted out because now this point here and this point are connected together by the by the wiper of the switch. Therefore, these resistors don't matter anymore. And now what you've just got is a 35K. It's not added to these. It's used instead of these. Uh, so that's how that works. Um, so let's look at when you're in current mode on the meter. 
Here's my little simplified view of it. It's all taking place here. This cluster of resistors essentially, and this is on the current range switch, it essentially boils down to this. I've drawn this symbol as a variable resistor and that is all of these resistors except for the two that I'm covering up with my finger. In other words, these four resistors are brought into play in different combinations depending on the current range. The 97 ohm resistor I've got shown here is the parallel equivalent of the 3300 ohm resistor and the 100 ohm or yeah 100 ohm resistor it comes out to 97 ohms so that's here and this is what it looks like in effect you've got your current coming through from the positive side of the main uh, rectifier going through the relay contact going through the current limiting circuit going through the current limiting transistor and then jumping to here now we go through the shunt resistor that's these and then out through here this resistor is this and out to the positive terminal so it's acting just like a normal current shunt most of the current goes this way but some uh, ratio goes through this alternate path through the meter and all this uh, resistor here does is it scales it such that uh, you get the requisite amount of current through the meter uh, proportional to the current going out of the uh, terminal of the power supply. So again, very simple. Uh, there's a third way that the meter is used, and that is to adjust the Zener current for the last stage of the reference power supply. Again, like I said earlier, for best rely or best accuracy and best stability, this Zener should have a certain amount of current going through it, and that is adjusted by this uh, a trimmer potentiometer, essentially. You set it once and hopefully don't have to set it again, but if you did have to set it again, uh, the power supply includes a way of setting it. So you switch a different switch. It's not on the front panel. It's something you have to open up the case to get at but there is the switch on the side of it there and when you put that in Zener current mode it ends up hooking up the meter in this kind of configuration this resistor here is this resistor here so it's on the negative side of the reference power supply and on the rail that goes all the way out to the negative output of the power supply so that's here and then this line here on the positive side of the reference supply going to the cathode of the final Zener diode and on out to be used as part of the reference supply that's here and here's the Zener diode and its series resistor that's this guy right here uh, when we have the switch the internal switch in the uh, Zener current mode, it connects up the meter between the anode of the Zener diode and the negative rail of the reference supply. That essentially puts the meter and this 10 ohm resistor in parallel with this resistor here. So some of the Zener current goes this way and some of it goes this way but again it's scaled by the values of the resistor uh, to give you an accurate reading on the meter of the uh, required Zener volt uh, current when you adjust this potentiometer down here so that's the third mode of meter connection